this is the first thing we're reading with that, that was written in English natively. So we'll read several things in the class that's written in English natively. This, Hamlet, and Paradise Lost. I think, I think that might be it. But uh, I didn't figure that having a class on Western culture would be complete unless there was some British lid in here. Uh, we can't act like France and Italy and Spain and all these countries were doing their thing. But we have to spend at least a little bit of time with Britain. So, um, Jeffrey Chaucer lived, he lived about a generation after Dante. Uh, give me guys an exact date here. 1340 to 1400 is when he lived. Dante, if you remember, was at the very tail end of the 1200s when he was alive. And Geoffrey Chaucer was probably about two generations past Dante, really. But um, this guy was very rich. Right? He was, he actually worked for the crown. And he was an ambassador to other countries, you know, for the king. So this, this guy was very well learned, very respected. And this text that he wrote, the Canterbury Tales, it's a valuable historical document as much as it is a literary document. Because of all authors, Geoffrey Chaucer gives us an idea of like all the different classes of people, like all the different jobs that there were in the Middle Ages. Diff different satires about different characters. This is this is a very witty book if you read through the whole thing, and it's very loosely structured. Um, the very the general prologue is where you get an introduction to all these different characters. So you get the knight, the miller, wife of Bath, the pardoner, the summoner. Um, the nun, the nun's priest. You get a you get a wide variety of characters that he kind of and basically the structure is each one of these characters. They're all going on this pilgrimage. They're they're all going to the whole. They're starting at Canterbury, and their the idea is they're all going to the Holy Land together. All these different people. So um, along the way, they tell. Each person tells a story. So some type of like story, fictional story. So um, so much of like what each character's story is about says something about the character in a way. And the wife of Bath is an interesting character because well, her prologue is actually longer than her actual story. And if you guys, if you guys noticed, her actual story is only like a page and a half, right? The whole introduction to this woman is, is what's really long. She's she is an icon of English lit. This, this character is an icon. She is. I mean, when it comes to feminist criticism of literature, right, looking at the roles of women in different time periods, right, this woman is something else, right, trying to sort of wrap our mind around her. We'll dive into her, but I wanted to first introduce you guys a little bit to the language of Chaucer. This is something that you guys didn't have in your book. Because in the book, it's more translated over to like what, what modern English looks like. So Chaucer wrote in Middle English. I think I told you guys before that Old English, so the language that was around 800 to 1100, Old English doesn't, didn't look a thing like modern English. Old English did not look anything like it. It, it, it reads more like a modern German, more, more like modern German, because English originally originated from those Germanic languages. Right? So unlike French or Spanish, right, those originated from Latin, 
you know, English originated from these German languages. So the old, I can actually, I'll actually show you guys a passage of old English just to show you, just to prove my point here. You know, the most famous literary work of old English is Beowulf, which is in our book. I didn't assign it though, because it would be kind of redundant with other stuff we've done. But um, if you look at if you look at Beowulf here, this is the old English version. I don't know if you guys, I'll zoom in so you guys can see that really good. All right. Just read the first four lines, right? You can't even decipher it. Right? It looks more like German than it does English today. So the way that you would tell the word order of the sentence, like you might ask yourself, what's the subject? What's the verb? What's the object? In modern English, it goes in order. Right? You always have a subject first. You always have your verb next. You always have your object. Well, in old English, it didn't work that way. You have to kind of figure out what the subject of the sentence is or what the direct object of the sentence is based off the endings of the words, right? So if you, if you go back to, if you actually learn old English, I took a course on it once. I don't remember much on it now because it's been like 10 years since I took a course. Back then, I was actually pretty good at it. But I couldn't do a thing, a thing with it now. But uh, you, you pretty much decipher the words based on the endings. So you can kind of make a lot of these words kind of make a little bit of sense. They sound like modern English. Um, so that's the original. So I should I should make a mention too that. In the year 1066, 1066, that is when France invaded England, 1066. That event's called the Norman Conquest. But when France invaded England in one, you know, they installed new sets of kings. So a lot, a lot of French people moved over to England. So over the course of a couple of hundred years, the French language and the English language at the time sort of merged and made more of, and what made what was called Middle English. Middle English, you can actually understand. You can actually understand it if you read it. Um, you might disagree with me on that here when I read it for you in a second. But it, it's actually understandable. The reason for that is, you know, you now, you now have subject, verb, object, right? You can, it, it very much resembles their modern language. The only difference is spelling wasn't standardized. So like lots of different words are spelled in different ways, right? They spelled words like they sounded. So there wasn't any like spelling rules, but also the, the syllables sound different, so, or, the, the, or the vowels sound different, I should say. So like an A has like an E sound, an E has an ah sound. So the way that you pronounce the vowels is different. You know, over a couple of hundred years after Chaucer, that's when we started pronouncing vowels differently way that we do now like with a we have a uh, or a e is a eh, right so we started pronouncing the vowels differently so this is the general prologue of the canterbury tales take a look at the general prologue in your book and that on the, in the book it's on page uh, 11 13 and pay attention to me as I, so as I read it in the original, listen and read it, read the modern with it as I read it in the original. Just to, 
just to kind of see like how cool this is. I go over this stuff because it's actually pretty cool. I love, I love this stuff. So um, listen while I read it in the original. Listen and read the modern. And you can kind of see the words here as I as I read as I go down. So Juan that April with the Shura Sota, the drooth of March hath pierced to the Rota, and bothered every vein in such liqueur of which vertu engendered is the floor. Juan Zophorus ache with the Sweta braith, and spirit hoth in every holt and haith, the tendra croppas and the yanga sana hoth in the ram is half course irona. And small fallas making melodia that slept on all the neeked with open ear. So pricketh him nature in her carages, and then longing folk to go on pilgrimages. And palmeris for to sake in stranja strandas, to fern hawas, cooth in sandry landas, and especially from every shira's inda of Angeland to Canterbury they weaned up. The holy blissful martyr for to Seca, that him hath holpen one, but they were Seca. So, uh, what did you guys what you guys make of that? Did you under did it did, you, did it sound like gibberish to you when I read it? Did it sound did it sound? How did it sound? Pig Latin. Pig Latin. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's actually pretty cool. Uh, like, like, I'll just go over like a couple of ways you pronounce the words. So, uh, any word that ends with an e has an ah sound. So, one that opera with the sure as sota. It has any word that ends with rota. Any words that end with an e have uh, like the uh sound. Right, so that just goes to show you E's sounded like A's do now. Um, let's see. The double E, the double E, when Zothrus ache with the sweet uh, breath, the double E has the A sound. Ache, breath. Um, This word is night, right? It's pretty easy to tell this word's night, right? But the way that they would pronounce it then would be neat, neat, that's sleeping all the neat with open ear, with open eye. So some, some of the consonant sounds are the same, but the vowels is what makes it sound weird, right? Because like I said, they pronounce the vowels differently then. So um, if you actually if you actually hear a professional read it, like I do a pretty damn good job, I think. Right. But if you actually listen to like a medieval scholar read this, it sounds it sounds really cool when they read it, when they read it that way. But as you see, the spelling isn't standardized. Look at how April spelled. Look at how drought is spelled. Um, so if you if you guys would have taken the Brit Lit One class, the English Two Hundred, instead of this class, you would actually have to read it in that instead of in the translation. So uh, good thing that you're uh, taking the Two Thirty class instead, right? Well, you don't have to read it in the OG. So uh, yeah, you, you probably you guys probably all disagree with me, right? That doesn't sound anything like modern English. But it, it actually you can actually make sense of it if you read it. You might have to pay a lot of really sharp attention to it. You kind of have to wrap your mind around it, but it, you can read it in the original. 
Because I just, yeah, I just wanted to go over that just to give you guys an appreciation of our language and how it works, how it got to where it is today. Now at this point, I'll show you guys this too, just as a little cool thing. Let's see. Tales, manuscripts. And the British Library has copies of uh, some of these original manuscripts. They're actually pretty cool to look at. Uh, you guys might have seen, you guys might have seen like Bibles and stuff that look like this. Let's zoom in real good here. Oops. See if I can get a PDF. The kind of thing I'm getting ready to show you is exactly why I'm not a medieval scholar. Right, but if we zoom in, if we can zoom in, really good. <laughs> Give me a second, I'll find a good one. Yeah, so as you, if we look through this document, you know, you see that it's written in this, these are beautiful books. These are beautiful books to read. But they would cop the, the scribe would actually copy the book down and they would leave letters out, right? Because when you're when you're um, writing something down, you want to take some shortcuts, right? So like so they had symbols like whenever they left the different words out. So you can barely tell it by looking at this, but um, if you're trying to read through one of these original documents today, you kind of, it's even almost like solving a puzzle to understand like how, how is this word being spelled? Because there was lots of shortcuts that these writers took in leaving like different letters out. So this is the practice today that we call calligraphy. Right? Calligraphy, that's kind of deciphering through these old medieval manuscripts, trying to make sense of them, trying to um, decipher them. So that's how they wrote back then. As you see, the hand right, here's, here's a nice one that's got Chaucer on his horse here. This is the beginning of the knight's tale. So, you know, this is a, this is basically how these old medieval manuscripts look like. I've seen Bibles, like really old Bibles with these types of like decorations and stuff in them. But um, yeah, it's it's an act of puzzle solving, even to kind of like even make sense of these because they leave so many letters and stuff like that out. So. Um, I think I stopped my share there. Yeah, this type of thing is exactly why I'm not a medieval scholar, right? Because this stuff is a pain in the neck. I, I, took, a, I took a class on, when I was in graduate school, I took a class on medieval Latin, right? And I would read through these old manuscripts. Frankly, my, my eyesight is too bad to make sense of... Uh, some of these things. You try to make sense of them, zooming in on an electric document and stuff. And I can't even see them that good. So um, kudos to the medieval scholars, right? It's a very, the, the, the medieval scholars, like God bless them. That's all I know to say, right? Because there's no way that I could do this stuff professionally. Like, my, my interest in medieval is very passing, right? I love it, but there's no way I could specialize in it because this stuff would drive me crazy. So, uh, 
I don't know. Any any thoughts on this type of stuff? Calligraphy and these old documents and stuff like that before I move on? I love the the writing, mm. but and the 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 documents and the the paper and stuff that that they the papyrus and parchment and stuff like that. I, I love that. It's uh, it reminds me of days gone by. But um, I, the reading it <laughs> now that's a whole nother. It's interesting to look at and think, like, you know, how you read the Spanish directions on something. And right. I wonder if I'm saying this right, but yeah. I'm on mute. I've got kids in the background. You're good. Yeah, all the, I went over all this stuff because it's interesting. Like, it's the history of the book, right? The, the act of even getting books is an interesting history in and of itself. And this was before the printing press, right? So this was how these texts were reproduced, was writing them down in this handwriting. And they'd leave out these letters and stuff. Right? You kind of have to, uh, you gotta have to know the code in order to even make sense of it. Like, like a, a dot would, for instance, would oftentimes mean like that's an A. Right? So instead of just writing the A, they just put a little dot, for instance. Right, so um, that sounds that sounds kind of lazy, right? But I, I guess when you know you're writing a whole book down, right? You got to take some shortcuts, or your hands going to go numb, right? <laughs> so thank your editors for giving you the the modern the modern day English. Right, this. This, this is nothing like what the OG is. Other thoughts before I move on? Have I inspired any future medieval scholars here? Have, you know, have I? Are you, are you going to go on a quest to read medieval documents now? Probably not, right? <laughs> but it's the same. It's the same thing with stuff like Don Hay. Right? If you go and read the original Don Hay and the original manuscripts, it's the same type of stuff, right? So, except you have to know Italian to be able to decipher that. So, um, medieval scholars are. Like I said, they're all brilliant people. Most of them know a ton of languages. Right? A good medieval scholar knows Latin. A good medieval scholar knows French. A good medieval scholar knows Italian, oftentimes Spanish as well. So uh, I told you guys before, learning all those languages together is actually not that hard because they both all came from Latin. But good medieval scholars have to learn all these languages. Right, so like I said, God bless. Them. It's actually not a field of English that's actually in demand. So people who study this stuff, there's not really a lot of demand for professors in it, which is kind of sad. So with a little bit of that down, let's move into the actual literature and talking ideas and all that then. We have this character called the wife of Bath, right? You know, we this woman, like I said, she's she's pretty out there. We learn that she's on her third marriage, right? This is a time period in which women weren't allowed to divorce, right? So she's on her third marriage. Um, you know, she uh She's described, she has a gap tooth, right? She's, she's very portly, right? Which is, which is a nice way of saying she's a little chunky, right? She's, she's thick, right? Yeah, she's, she's all open about her sexuality and stuff, right? This is a woman that talks about 
that talks openly about this subject, right? Which is pretty, which is for the time is pretty, pretty odd. Uh, and then she ends up telling us this really weird story about the knight raping a woman, rape, rape, the knight rapes a girl, right? He kind of has to go on this quest to understand what women want. All right, so we'll break that down. Once, we'll break the actual tale down once, once we get to it. It's, it's a really weird story. So I'll just open the floor up to you all. What did you think about this character, especially from like a feminist point of view? Right? Do, do you think that she's a progressive character for the time? Right, so ex explain, explain why so. Uh, to me, women didn't act like that back in those days. Like you didn't know, you didn't like you said, didn't talk openly about sex. It wasn't about what you wanted. It was about pleasing your man. And if he if he wasn't pleased, it was okay to beat on you, and you had no no say about it. So yeah, I think she was very pro and to be married that many times. Like I I feel like. Uh, I think that was a, that that she was a, the gap, you know, was a, a, a poke at her being loose. Mm. So, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think she, she was a very, very progressive character for the, for that time. Like, I think this was like a, um, another one of those uh, comp, like the comedy where you know, people are dying and all this stuff. Like it's a, it's a, yeah. Like a future, uh, <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's his dream. Like, what if this would, what if this would, ha it wouldn't, this would never happen. So let's yeah. write about it. I think it's yeah. one of them deals. Definitely a picture. <laughs> yeah. Picture In that period. Yeah. Right. We got a man writing about a very scary woman, right? That would probably never, uh, that they would probably never see. Yeah. And about his mom. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's good. I like where, like where, uh, the where he she's a ugly hag and and he you know he don't he has the. I, I can't explain it, but he, yeah, like he, he thinks his life is ruined and, you know, it, it all worked out because he, he felt the question that he had been seeking, <laughs> like, and, and everything worked out, but I'll let you get back to. Yeah, well, we'll get back to the actual story. Right now, we're kind of more along the lines of the character before the story. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But the story, the story is something else. I, I can't, I can't wait to break this one down with you all. Are the rest of you guys think of her, um, of this character? I thought she was very progressive and she talked about even if her husband died, she would marry again. She was going to marry as many times as she wanted. She had no desires to be single. I think even probably in today's time, Liz Taylor couldn't hold her a lot to shine by. <laughs> right. She she does this. She does this. Why? Why do why does she like to marry so many times? Right. One of you guys, one of you guys, answer that one. Why? Why does she keep marrying after she gets? She, she seems like an attention whore. Um, she just uh, was not pleased with one man. She just had to bounce from uh, man to man, and uh, I mean, saying that uh, women got their way by uh, nagging men. It's how uh, women got they want from men. And then uh, basically it seems like she uh, just based everything on sexual, sexual needs. 
Yeah, but I, th- I think I think the text backs you up right there, right? She's like, "Why did God give us these private? Why did God give us genitals? Right? He wanted us to use them. Right? All they all these rules about, you know, having sex, right? All these rules are they're, they're stupid. Right? God gave it gave us the parts. We might as well use them, right? That's kind of that's kind of her uh, argument here." Right, so she she like she likes sex, right? That that's one reason why she jumps man to man, right? Any other thoughts? Why does she keep jumping man to man here? Also, maybe because um, she viewed that, like in the Old Testament Bible, that men in that time would marry multiple women at a time, and she was thinking, well, why can't I do that? Right, yeah, you're exactly right, Emily. Right, she talks about bigamy and stuff like that. Right, she's like, well, it's not fair that a man can do that, but not a woman. Right, right. Probably point well taken there. Right, she's she's showing the hypocrisy of of these types of of these types of things. And you know that hypocrisy is still true today. If a man sleeps around, he is a moncho. But if a woman does it, then she's the scum of the earth. And so those gender roles are still in place even today. Right. Yeah, it's, it's hard to argue otherwise, right? It, it's true. Yeah, Emily's leading us down an interesting path here. In the fact, in the fact that she uses scripture to back up her points all the time, I, mean, I don't know. I don't know if you guys noticed that, but she's always using scripture. She's citing the from scripture this whole this whole thing to back herself up. All right, so that that was a practice that called glossing. I, mean, I showed you guys those um, manuscripts, but oftentimes editors would. For writers, when they're copying the books, they would write like little footnotes, right? So that's what she's doing here, right? She's adding her own little footnotes, almost like she's citing. Oh, she's almost like writing a paper, right? She's citing the from the Bible, right? All of her points she's making, and that's points that you wouldn't think that the Bible would say, right? She uses the Bible, right, to make to make all of her arguments, which is that which is actually pretty wild. Using scripture to back her evil ways. Right. Well, are they are they evil ways? I know this this is setting us up for a hot debate here, right? Yeah, because she uses the story about the woman at the well that he come upon and he's telling her about all the husbands that she's had, and she uses that to justify all of the men that she's had too. Um I don't think her ways were evil. If, um, if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. What <laughs> makes a woman any different than a man? If he can have as many partners as he wants, why can't she? Yeah, if that's what makes makes you happy. Or if that's what you need, if that's what you have to have. Go, Yeah, thanks perception is reality if you believe that you if if she whatever she believes makes it okay then it makes it okay (laughs) yeah she kind of um takes the bible and twists the um scripture to fit her situation right and that's done today too <laughs> for a lot of situations. Yeah, I would actually be interested to read this thing and like look up all the Bible quotes at the same to see how like what the Bible quote says, just to see how much she's twisting the words. Like that that's something I want to do sometime. Like they gives us, it gives us the Bible quotes and the footnotes, but I, I didn't actually like go and read the Bible quotes at the same time. And I, that would actually be a fun exercise, I think. 
I read another one of the tips because I've got a different uh, version of the book and it has her and I read something that her name is Allison. Mm -hmm. And so this had, I, hold on, I can't remember the name. Of, hold on, let me see if it's, if I can pull it out real quick. Um, anyway, I can't remember, you know how the, um, it's the group, like the Miller and the, uh, they're at the end, the night, and they're all at the end. And one of those tells a story about, and there's there's like the, the good friar, the good the good preacher, and then the friar that's taking all the money and whatever. They each give their little story. And um, Allison's in here, and one of the preachers. Uh, they're, and all these stories have like a lesson and there's something to be learned and they're getting at them. Then there's like a funny a kind of a an ironic ending. And Allison's in here and she's a, she's married to one guy and she's trying to figure out how to get to another. Uh, like she's wanting another guy. So, you're, talking, you're talking about the Miller's Tale. Yes, the Miller's Tale. And, and so they come up with this plan and to, cause that guy's a lot older than her and they tell him it's gonna flood like the, like Noah and be like Noah and get all these bathtubs and stuff. And, and she, while he's doing all this he, and woodworking and stuff, she's hemmed up with that. Uh, he's like a scholar or a teacher or something. And he's supposed to be a holy man too, so. But yeah, like he, she takes off with another man and um, her, her, like he's a, he's at the window doing, talking crap to her while they're, her, her and her husband's laying in the bed and he farts out the window <laughs> in that guy's face. Like it, all kinds of stuff happens. Like it was, I, I was reading that and it was crazy. Uh, I was like, this is, this is something. But yeah, when I, it, when I figured out that, that bass name was Allison. I, that was funny, but yeah, she's a, she is a character. Yeah, that's 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 the best story in the whole thing. Right? They didn't put, <laughs> they didn't put it in our book for some reason. Yeah, I I really liked it. If you guys have it have a chance, read it. Yeah, the way the Canterbury Tales starts out, you have the knight who tells us like really boring story of like chivalry and. Yeah. Rescue, rescuing the dame and all that right then the miller wow. just then the miller just comes in and tells this completely like raunchy story about yeah. about, about cuckolding and about yeah yeah the, the fart jokes in it right yeah so. now the and wife all drunk at this end telling this story and they're like preaching at each other you know like trying to trying to prove their point and these stories are proving it, it's just really cute like it's like a, a mini movie playing out in your head yeah the white's tale was about middle of the way through the whole thing if you look at the whole if you look at the whole thing forgot to mention at the beginning of class Chaucer actually didn't get to finish his project like he, he said he lays out a bunch of characters in the prologue he doesn't write the story for each one he died before he could finish it unfortunately but um, the partner is another good one I was telling you guys last week about Catholic priests selling trinkets and stuff like that that's what the character of the partner is yeah, that one's in my book too. He actually interrupts the wife in the middle of her story here to like ask to like be snide and rude. Yeah, because it it was talking about her being uh, also being uh, how she had a gap between her teeth, and it explained her almost identical to the way it did in in Bath, but it said she was she was. <sighs> No, maybe that was the the other. Anyway, anyway, but it's talking about her hips and and like yeah, like it was it, yeah. They're just it's really like dirty if you read it. Like 
and I'm thinking, hmm, in between friars and priests, and then you got throbbing hips and <laughs> all kinds of stuff. I was like, crazy. Was earlier when we were talking about why does she keep getting married over and over, you guys were leaving out one big one, and that's money, right? She's also very money hungry, right? You know, the vo being a widow was the only way that a woman could own property right, in this time period. So, like. That's the she. So she's a very rare woman in the fact she's filthy rich right, because she she's now has the estates of three husbands, right? So the more men she marries, the more men she kind of like eats through, right? The more her wealth piles up. So she's kind of the dictionary. She's like the original like gold digger type, right? That that's that's another aspect of her character here. So. Uh, She's sucking the life out of them. She's the Black Widow. Like you, they they start like they go they go down as when she gets a hold of them. <laughs> there's there's your argument, Timmy, for why she's why she's evil. Well, I think it's uh, weird that you know she thought her fifth husband was her true love. Whenever uh, he like you know he. He beat her up and everything. Like, uh, it's almost like, you know, she's this way, but she fell in love with someone who somewhat tried to control her. Like, she um, is attracted to somebody that is more like her. Like, how she Yeah, done she others. met her match. Yeah. And <laughs> uh, it's like a turn on for us. Like, oh, yeah, beat the hell out of me. I love it. <laughs> it's weird I mean and it's a lot of people are that way right yeah she wanted to, she, this guy Jenkins right he's much younger than her right too right yeah she's trying to like tame the bad boy here right that, that's kind of what that's kind of what wasn't he like wasn't he cuckolding or something her too like it, yep. it was talking about cheating or something and that's yeah like he, they're, he had they're a mistress off of each other mm -hmm. she uh it's like she finally met one she couldn't control and it's uh it's bothered her, bothered her. so yeah the We'll get back to that idea of control, right? Because that's something that the story is all about, right? But uh, you're exactly right, Kenny. She wants to control, and he tries to control her, right? We learn that he reads her all these old, so he goes back and reads her stuff like we've been reading, right? Look at Dido, right? She's she's such a you know, she's she's such a she's such a woman, right? You know, let, let's let hear about how Helen of Troy was a hoe, right? He he's read he keeps reading her like all this misogynist anti-women stuff, right? To kind of like put her in her place too. So he's actually making her read that type of stuff. He's kind of denigrating her, right? Well. Like like Tenny said, it's, it's not just with sexual stuff, right? He's a, he's he, they den he denigrates her that way, but he beats her, and he also he's tells her she's a good her woman. place. Right? Like, it, it, look, this is your place. It's all through history. This is your place. Yeah, she she's the the night that she kind of goes off on him, right? He's reading about. Eve and how Eve is the original wicked woman and all this stuff. Of course, she gets back at him, right? She she hits him in the head, and uh, 
Well, first he hits her in the head, right? She loses her hearing. Right? So she, she gets back at him. Right? And eventually he kind of like says, oh, my God, right? You're crazy, right? Take what you want. Right? Now that's, kind of, that's kind of how her experience with him ended. She says, and when I saw he would never refrain from reading on this cursed book all night, and suddenly three leaves I've ripped right out of his book as he read, and also with my fist, I, I took him on the cheek so that backward in our fire right down fell he. He starts up like a lion who's gone crazy and with his fist. He hit me on the head, so on the floor I lay like I were dead. When he saw how still it was I lay, he was aghast and would have fled away till at last out of my swoon I awoke. Oh, hast thou slain me, false thief? And then I spoke. And for my land, hast thou now murdered me? Before I'm dead, yet will I still kiss thee. He said, Allison, my sister dear, never more will I hit you in God's name. If I've done so, you are yourself to blame. I pray you, your forgiveness now I seek. And right away, I hit him on the cheek and said, thief, now this much avenged am I. I may no longer speak, now I will die. So after that, he gives her all of his property. And I guess because he's ashamed that he almost killed her, right? So he just kind of gives up all of the stuff. So pretty, pretty wild, right? I guess I bet you guys weren't expecting to read a story of domestic abuse and all this stuff that, that we're getting here, right? But, but as Timmy said, right, she kind of eats up, she kind of eats this up. She loves the toxic relationship here. Well, after uh, with this strata pretty open figure, we're going about hear about anything in this <laughs> class now. <laughs> Right, you know this. This certainly isn't a rated G class, right? Mm -hmm. this, cer this certainly is not that. It's good though; it's entertaining. Agreed, right? The pr the prim and proper stuff. That's no fun, right? Well, other thoughts about this character. Here, here's a question for you all. Um, do you think that she is a stereotype, right? Do you think Chaucer's painting this her sarcastically here, almost like, oh my God, here's what a here's a monster, right? Here's a monstrous woman, right? This remember, this is a guy writing this 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 woman, right? So is she is she actually progressive or is she just like something to laugh at and make fun of i guess that's the question i'm asking or was he transgender wishing that he was a woman that could live that way all right i i don't know about i don't know about all that right These were probably his, he probably took his, his, his wives or his lovers and, and wrote, wrote, they had, they had a character in this, in this place. But I, I really do feel like it, yeah, it, it could be in those times they could make fun that this could be something, oh, that would never happen, you know, like women didn't act like that. So, like. Well, or he could have been that way and just wrote it as like a woman doing it. Because like I said, you know, men, it's like it was okay for men to be that way. So say he was really that way and then just wrote it from like. Uh, Tending to be, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like portraying himself as a woman, but instead of, uh, targeting himself trying to make it seem like it was the other way around yeah because i mean if he was that way it wouldn't be out of the norm right oh right. 
this is godly times like you're you're burning in hell quick if you're you know what I mean the church pull the church comes in now <laughs> it's like he takes every bad quality that he can think of and characterizes it towards her <laughs> in every way Make, makes her the worst possible woman <laughs> that he could yeah a monster like mm-hmm. like i think this is the the they would have girls probably read this this is how not to act this was in their finishing or their primary finishing school or something this is how you don't act this is the boogie this is the boogie woman (laughs) yeah the the crazy thing is this character could exist in the realm of possibility right just because you know, she she could eat through these men and inherit all their money and all this stuff, right? Well, she does exist. It's my ex-wife. What is it? I said she does exist. It's my ex-wife. <laughs> <laughs> right. How would we write? The, how would you guys tell me if you were writing the story today and you were creating a similar character, what kind of qualities would she have? How would we write the worst possible woman we could write today? With our modern values. Well, a saying that I've heard most of my life is, we would probably say that she's give more rides than Greyhound. Right. <laughs> right, right. So again, we that idea of how many lovers and all that, right? That's still something that we would focus on today, maybe. And a, a cheater. A, a cheater. Like nobody, like that's the worst hurt there is, especially when you love somebody. And, and if you have, if you're with a serial cheater, you know, I think that goes in there too. So an adulterer would, would definitely, would definitely be a characteristic. You guys think it's worse for, you guys think it's worse for women who do that type of thing than it is for men? The judgments? Yeah, I think it it is portrayed that way, but I don't think it's any different. It's not. I don't see how it is any different. No. Because, uh, I mean, my wife, we in June would have been 11 years, and she cheated on me. She left in June, left me and our three kids. So, I mean, it, it don't get any worse. No. So, if a guy cheats, are they judged as harshly as, as women who cheat? No, not at all. And I don't know why. Like one of you guys say something? <laughs> I feel like women are more um, judged and more criticized about cheating on a man than than men because oh, that's that's what a man does. Women, yeah, that, you know, women are the housewives and. Yeah, men are expected to do it, so it's not. Yeah, right. and but it's like these men that feel this way. Women are not equal, but they're held at a higher standard, which is, I mean, it's just um, living a double standard is what they do. I mean, men are shitty. Shitty people. <laughs> I mean, be honest. Women can be too. Yeah, absolutely. But eh. All right. So you would you would paint her as a cheater on top of getting around a lot, right? Does this idea of you know sort of the Money hungry woman's only out to get a rich guy's money. I think that that's still an idea that exists today. I mean, 
you see it all the time when a young girl marries like a 70 something year old man, right? That, that's sure my, not my wife was 29 and left for a 50 year old man that don't work and has nothing. So, I mean, some people just lose their mind, I guess. <laughs> Yeah. I think men and women, they cheat for different reasons. Um, men generally cheat because it's available. And women, they generally start an affair mentally long before they ever have sex. Right. Yeah, maybe, maybe do you think that might be why? It's deemed worse for women who do it, right? Because theirs is of well, the heart, whereas men I do think it for pleasure. Yeah. Well, um, I think some women do it to escape responsibility too. I mean, men, and then you men will do it and be like, "Well, I can't help it." Like, well, I mean, pieces of crap usually can't help anything, but. The grass. I, I swear to God, every single story we've read in here has been about my marriage. It's ridiculous. <laughs> uh -oh. I'm gonna I'm withdraw. <laughs> <laughs> well, was you gonna say the grass is greener on the other side? Is that what you were gonna say a second ago? Yeah. I like I just think some people are just like that like he said it, I don't want to say they can't help it but I mean they just it, it's it's a sickness really like they like they I don't know they they get something from it that a cheater don't under that a, a somebody that would cheat or don't cheat don't understand like I never could or and and even uh the gold, the gold digger, you know, like, I, I don't, I you guess know, I, I, I guess I'm married for love, like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I've had to take a lot of classes, and, you know, there is something that's also called love addiction, and when the news starts to wear off, they're already thinking about the next person, because they like that giddy feeling, and it's, the equivalent of using some kind of drug. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. With your work, Sherry, they uh, encourage people not to get in relationships, right? After they're when they're in rehab, right? Because it's the same feeling. Two years. Right. Most most people can't make it that long, right? Because they're used to. They're used to that uh, high and low feeling. I actually teach healthy relationships, and a lot of them don't know what a healthy relationship even looks like. They've never even seen a resemblance of what one is. And so, you know, they're really surprised when they learn about boundaries and how important Right. Yeah, that's if you're on that type of stuff, right? You probably the boundaries and whatnot probably uh, aren't there. Yeah, interesting stuff. Let's move on to the to the story now, the story that she tells. All right. To give us a nod. You. You're you're ready for the story. All right. To give a synopsis, the knight rapes a girl, right? So they say that they set they set the knight down on a quest to say what do women want? All right, well, he goes on his quest, then he meets this old hag. All right. The old hag's like, let's get married. All right. You really don't have a choice. Let's let's get married. And he's like, oh, okay. Right, but she gives him a choice, though. Right? She says when she gets married, she says, here's the choice. 
you can either, I can either turn into a young, beautiful girl, but you'll have to always worry about me cheating on you, right? They, they called it cuckolding, right? The cuckold had horns, right? A guy, a man cuckold would, wear, would have horns, right? If a woman cheated on him. You can either be a cuckold with your horns or uh, I'll be old and I'll look like an old hag, but I'll always be loyal to you, right? I'll always love you. So uh, that's the choice that she gives him. What's he say? You, he doesn't want to make out his decision. He says, you choose what you want to be. You choose, how, you want to be a young woman or old woman? You choose. She says, aha, exactly. My point exactly, right? That's what women want. Women want mastery. I mean, women want to be the boss in the relationship, right? Women are the, women want to get their way, right? So by saying, okay, you're taking your ego out of it, you're letting me make the decision, aha, that's exactly what women want, right? And then, and then the night gets away scot-free at the end, right? He gets married, everything's happy ever after, right? He's not even punished really for his, for his rape at the beginning, right? He, he gets, he finds his true love. She turns into a hot young girl, right? Happily ever after. So with that synopsis, what do you guys think of uh, the tale? Especially with the idea that that's what women want, to be in control, right? power in the relationship i don't agree with that i don't want power in my marriage i want my husband and myself to be in this relationship 100 100 when i can't be 100 then i want him to be and if he can't be then i will be but i don't agree that that is what some women may be and some men may be just on a power trip but that's not healthy <laughs> Well, it's a give or take. If um, one is not at their best, the other one really has to be, and then vice versa. But um, I don't know. I think deep down everybody wants a little bit of control because with control, you have – and I mean not like – not in a bad way, but a little bit of control gives you more freedom. I guess, and uh, not like to go out and do your own thing or anything like that, but it just, uh, you know what I mean. Right. Daddy, <laughs> give me a blanket. Others of you in here, what do you think of this idea? Do you agree with Sherry that, uh, or that that's not the case in her case, especially, right? Or some of you all are like, yeah, I really want to be the boss in the, in the relationship, right? You can even speak from your own experiences if you want. I personally I don't. don't. <laughs> it stresses me out to have control, so I just prefer to not. <laughs> You're not the one picking the restaurant. Emily? No, my boyfriend picks it. <laughs> <laughs> Although he tries to make me, but I don't want to. So, so that's, that's the old joke about letting the girl pick the restaurant, right? You, you say, pick the restaurant. And she says, no, you do it, honey. Right? The guy says, okay, give me three cho choices. Right? <laughs> He knows that the first one is the one that she she really wants to go to, right? So, right, that, there's that old joke. Right? right, well, I mean, I always have an idea of what I want, but I don't want to pick for everybody else. So <laughs> I'm just always like, no, you just pick. 
not. We that. would always uh, take turns, usually, or just point to the kids. What do you want? And then if they said a drive-through, then we would pick a restaurant. So. <laughs> I got out of that little story I did I mean it it might be control but I also got choice everybody wants a choice and like she was saying too that you know if you're equals then you both have a choice so I, that's that's what I got out of that little that that you know the what do women really want you know and at that time and I was thinking about that time they they had no power they had no control they had you know they were told what to do and and I got instead of control I was like you know maybe they just they want a, a say for themselves you know a, a choice freedom yeah that's that's definitely a more positive reading of it than what I'm positing, I guess. Uh, <laughs> in, in my opinion, in a relationship, one person has control. Somebody has to have control because somebody has to make a decision. And it might be, it's not necessarily controlling, but somebody has to take control of all situations. Maybe it's just that my situation is different. My husband is only home on Saturday. He leaves out Sunday. He comes home Saturday evening. He leaves out Sunday. So maybe that's why that I feel like our marriage is not about control. Because even though I am married, I am still a human. I'm still a person with my own thoughts and feelings. And I don't have to check with him that it's okay for me to do this. And he doesn't check with me unless we're going to spend a large amount of money. And then we're like, okay, anything more than $500 we talk about where I'm okay with him spending 500 bucks. But I think that we have, we started out in a relationship. We were open, honest about what we wanted and I think that makes a major difference when it comes to relationships as well. And I agree with Nicole that it is possible that all she wanted was just a choice. She wanted to know that what she wanted mattered. Right. I mean, where most men would just decide whatever they wanted and pick for the woman. And he gave her the choice herself. Right. Yeah. Very well, I good think point. That people just always consider control as a negative thing, but the way I'm explaining it is not in a negative way. So, like your marriage, yeah, it's now there's absolutely that's how all marriages should be. Absolutely. That's how my marriage was. But I mean, it's just like, stepping up and taking control of the situation otherwise I mean otherwise I just don't feel like you could live your best life. You're if you if you do not take control you are being controlled. Right. Because somebody is making all decisions for you and like moving you like a monopoly piece. But I and I know the, I know what you're saying, Kimmy. But like I'm and I'm saying, but I don't see you as the person that would be be looking at your wife and being like, "Oh damn it, I said you're you're going you do this, you're doing this." Just like you know, she said that he let her, her like the the uh, her husband made uh, let her. You know, well, you pick. You know, it, he and he what it wasn't. It, it's a selfless act and it's an act of love like it, it and I, I just like I said I don't see you taking something that somebody cared about and uh, away from them so I, I get what you're saying I know I get I know what you're saying you, you don't know her then 
I mean, you go ask her. <laughs> I'm talking about you. She don't, she don't know how to tell the damn truth. So, uh, well, that's when they feel like you, maybe they're lying, maybe they feel better. Yeah, I like your guys' analysis. I mean, with the equality in the relationship uh, yeah, yeah. that's a good i think that's a good way to analyze it yeah but then you have to have they won't have that authority over the wind say that I, I like that the men want to have the authority over their women some some people some and, people do and then but then they let the women decide you know where to eat what to do what they're going to wear uh, all this other stuff but they want to feel that control over the women of a dominance but the woman way. wants to too like that's that's what and i was sitting here thinking you know uh control in the bedroom yeah. is when like when uh, that's what a, a man wants your what some men say they want and then like you know but most women are able to turn over that control to make their, their make it a happy happy you know relationship, relationship because it would just collide and it's like you know what it's like you it's like you know what your your name and when i when i'm talking about this like i watch older couples are a whole lot better at this than younger couples do like if there's a power struggle with young kids it, it's screaming fighting you know and and it's just constant turmoil but older couples are a lot a lot more laid back and they can turn over that control or or it can be i don't it's not a power struggle it's it, it's equal mm -hmm. you you know why older couples are like it don't you because the man always gives in. <laughs> <laughs> he's smart. That's right. He's, he's smart. <laughs> now, well, listen, is that a jab at my age? <laughs> Honey, I'm right there with you. <laughs> you put, you're painting yourself no, in a corner. No, but I mean, like, you? older, older. <laughs> um, I'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 um, but um, just like for my my grandma a couple of years ago, which my papa died twenty years ago, she was ninety some years old, and older women are really strong willed, even if they don't, you know, regardless of how nice they are and everything. And, and no, it ain't. There's nothing wrong with it. I mean, it's just um, usually okay. Say. Back in older times, women stayed at home and men went to work. And, you know, nowadays men are like, oh, well, I take care of you. I do this. I do that. I pay the bills and everything. Yeah, well, shut the hell up because the woman runs the home and that is the most important thing. Yes. She stays yes, at home. She takes job. control of the kids. And I'm like, I'd rather be, I mean, not so much. I love my kids. I'm with them. <laughs> you know, we got we got 50 50 right now but i keep them 80 percent of the time because she just refuses to keep them but whenever she was job. home she was home and i was at work it's like come home and it's like well i just got off work you need to keep the kids no that's a the hardest job is to run a home mm -hmm. in my opinion i mean it I don't have the hardest job in the world, but I mean, if I was out, you know, uh, working with a shovel all day long, I'd still think it'd be an easier job instead of hand one, uh, you know, hand Three, one this right kids. here all day long. Yeah. That right there. Now she's hell on wheels. <laughs> <laughs> I think older people do. They've already had them fights and that power to struggle way yeah. back way back when mm -hmm. or grand, so I was thinking of my grandma and grandpa when I said that and I'm sure there's been yeah. been shit throw uh and whatever <laughs> back in the day so but I, I think they get that out of the system and then it's easier to and and trust too like it's hard when you're young to trust your your other half so I I think it's a it's a 
it's a it's a lot of things and um, the yeah and I don't already been hit with too many work boots, to work boots over the years wedding night <laughs> saying honey you choose but <laughs> unless it's the movie like he did if it's a big a big life altering thing but that's just me What you said a minute ago, Timmy, about the old people, the old couples, the man gives in, right? That's that's kind of the joke of the story, too, right? You know, men think they have the power, right? But it's really the women who have the power. That's kind of that's kind of the joke. Right? Men like to think they do, and men have the illusion, but it's really the women. My mom used to say, a man is the head of the house but a woman turns the neck. Right. In in an equitable relationship, right? That's a a good way to look at it. Well, my wife's grandma, whenever we first got married, she told her, you take care of the babies all day long. And when this man walks in the door, you should have dinner on the table and his bath water ready. <laughs> oh, my God. She said, she absolutely. Must... <laughs> yeah, if I do that for my husband, he's going to think I'm ready to drown, Dean. Yeah. He said, there's, there's something going on here. <laughs> What'd you do? What'd you do? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this this is a fun topic, right? Just because this, these power dynamics in relationships are a weird thing, right? I mean, like some men, I mean, that's why dominatrixes are a thing, right? Some men like to give up all the power entirely, right? Right, so, um, you know, the wife of Bath probably, the wife of Bath, this is kind of like a dominatrix type character here, right? Well, I mean, like, say, for instance, with money, because most people, I mean, most people, I guess you could say, live comfortably, but not too comfortably, just go spend whatever they want. I think that, you know, 99% of things in a relationship should be discussed and should be handled as such. I mean, it's just... uh, it ain't something like, oh, well, I just went and, uh, it's like, oh, yeah, it's like, well, uh, I'm going to check the bank. Oh, yeah, I spent $700 earlier. Went and played poker machines. I kind of lost a little bit. I mean, it's, uh, but it shouldn't be, uh, like, I, I always control money because, I mean, she just sucked up math as it is, so. I mean, it was, uh, so it wasn't, uh, you you make the best decision for your relationship. You know who is the, uh, it depends. You know who is the better. You know who's better at this and better, best at that. And, uh, and you, uh, plan accordingly. I mean, it's just, but it's right. Like, uh, like at man, though, that's not, it don't go on a lot in the world today. He gave her choice of like, well, you know, what is it that you want? What is it that you want to do? Most men just say, well, we're going to go do this. And they start walking and expect the woman to follow. There's no discussion to it. We haven't heard anything from you today, Lauren. What do you think about all of this? It's because I ain't shut up. <laughs> I'm not sure what to think of it all. I'm just trying to grasp everything that everybody's saying. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty wild conversation today. And if she's not already married, She's probably thinking, do I really want to put myself through this? (laughs) 
my friend uh, just got married three weeks ago and I was talking to her about it and, um, because they used to argue a lot. And I was like, well, are you guys doing better? And she said, yeah, we finally just got to the point where we were like, you know, we're going to be married now. There's no point in arguing over little petty things that don't matter. And oh that's gosh. important to think about when you're going to plan to spend the rest of your life with someone like, is this worth arguing over? something that's so small it doesn't even matter in the long run of things right but you know relationships that have a lot of arguing in that it could that you could clear the air for a little while but since it was already that way then it's almost like it is acceptable to be that way so something small could turn into something major down the road right Sometimes if you let the bottom. I mean, there up. is there really an argument ever worth having? Well, here's my the way I. I mean, they're mostly arguing. stupid as it is. Here's the way I would go about arguing: Is it going to matter in five minutes? Is it going to matter in an hour? Is it going to matter in a week? Is it going to matter in a year? If it's not, it's not worth it. You have to argue to get through the day. You need to start the next day by yourself. <laughs> right? Sleep on the couch. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, to be a medieval story, right? You guys probably never guessed how wild this would be, right? As far as... Uh, the content goes. But it's hard to argue that the wife as a character doesn't want the mastery. Right? I mean, she that's that's her whole thing with Jamie, right? She's trying to tame him, right? She's trying to tame the bad boy where she has power over him. Um, so that that's that's how she ticks as far as uh what gets her going and whatnot. Right. That's a stereotype oftentimes associated with women, I think, trying to tame the bad boys. I mean, men are no different as far as that goes, with trying to tame women who they shouldn't, probably shouldn't be with. Right. Both, both genders do it. Well, <laughs> <laughs> women, women try to tame bad boys. If I see a girl that's a bad girl, I'm like, Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> like what's what's the old saying? Making a hoe a housewife, right? That, that's kind of that's kind of what it's means. Them, yeah, I can't turn, turn a whore into a take them home to mommy. <laughs> <laughs> they just use them for one night. <laughs> yep. What I said, you know, I spent 11 years taking the trash out. I just left one really big piece of trash in the house the whole time. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just got married two months ago, Timmy. I'm always the one taking the trash out. So I feel yeah, good luck. Yeah. Hey, mar marriage is a beautiful thing. <laughs> it really is. I wouldn't give it up for nothing. The years we had and the kids we had together, but she can go to hell now. All right. Class, class is also proving to be good therapy today, right? This, is, this isn't just class. It's, th it's therapy. So. Sh Sherry's my assistant today. <laughs> This ain't English, English class, it's marriage counseling. <laughs> well, you know, they say marriage is the number one cause of divorce. True, right? 
But then if we just live life like the wife, right? Just uh, never, never got married or whatever, right? Just maybe we would be less stressed out, right? Who, who knows? Me and my husband have been married for 15 years. And I tell everybody that we live happily single married. I live in a 2,250 square foot house by myself with my cat, dog, hamster, and lizard. And he lives in a truck Monday through Saturday. But it works because it's like we're dating. When he comes home, we have a place up north. We go up there on the weekend. We spend the weekend together. And when we spend the weekend together, there's no TV, no internet. We don't even have power. It's very primitive. We just sit and watch the bear and the deer and we reconnect. I think marriage is truly what you make of it, no matter who you are. Right, that saves the monotony of the of marriage, right? The mundane. Yeah, so every Sunday rolls around, you get that giddy feeling like you're dating again whenever, like you get those butterflies when you're going to somebody's house because your husband's coming back home. Yeah, I'm glad that we're having all these discussions because later in the class, we're going to be reading a novel called Madame Bovary, right, which is about... Um, She's the most famous cheater in all of literature, right? That, that's what the Madame Bovary is about. It's a, it's a serial cheater woman, right? So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing you in class, Timmy, when, when uh, we get to that one. Well, yeah, I'm not the top to bite my tongue, so I'm <laughs> <really real. laughs> So I went to the dentist today, so my mouth is still numb, so I'm slurring and everything. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got you guys will love that novel when we get to it. It's 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 great. It's a great novel. We'll ask questions like, oh, was she should we feel sympathy for her and all this stuff when we get to that one. What one? Madame Bovary. That's the book we're going to read later in the class. Okay. So, yeah, that's what a book. What did you say was next week? The, the law, the Par Paradise Laws. Next Paradise week. Lost. Yeah. That's the one. That's the one I suggested that you get a um, a paper copy of. Just Wait, if we start that next week. Do you think that Walmart would have that? Um, let me let me just double check myself to see if that's actually what we're doing next week. Before I say, there is a there's some really good websites like um for the book for this course I got on uh, Norton what www.norton.com. Anybody else order that book? It's just the website. It's like I uh, almost like I uh, e rented it rented it or something. I couldn't find it anywhere else. But uh, they got some really good websites you can order off of or just do like a small rental. Like uh, so what was, the, what was the name of the book that um, you wanted us to get a paper copy of? A Paradise yeah. Lost. Yeah. Okay. I ordered mine on September the 23rd, and I still do not have it. It shows oh that God. it is in transit. And it's only coming from South Carolina. Good news. Good news. Good news is I'm looking at the syllabus and I actually have Paradise Lost a couple of weeks from now. Okay. Um, we're gonna do Ham Hamlet next week by Shakespeare. Do they have it at the uh, library at the school? Do you know? They should. Up, up at Logan campus, they should. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I forgot you was in Wyoming County. Yeah, that, you can definitely find a copy on Amazon, I'm sure. Um, if you go to, I do know, like, if you go to stores like Books a Million, they got it there. Is it expensive? 
Yeah, uh, probably 10, 15 bucks. You think? Oh, I got mine for a dollar twenty-three. And it was like three ninety-nine shipping. On Amazon. Yeah. I paid three two let's see, I paid right it was over two hundred dollars for a DSM. And I had class was starting like the next day and I had waited and the the library had like an old copy, but for a, a, a diagnostic, new diagnostic manual, I paid. Oh, it was over two. It was over two hundred dollars at Books a Million. And then I got online and seen how much they were. It was like a quarter of that. I was puked. Yeah, we won't get the Paradise Lost till mid October, so you guys still have some time. Later. Is that from uh, John Milton? Yeah, John Milton. Yeah, it's a uh, five dollars used on Barnes and Noble. Yeah, eight twenty three on Amazon. And in in November, that'll be when we read Madame Bovary, and that's outside the book too. So, actually, I actually I actually have a digital copy of Paradise Lost up. So you don't necessarily have to buy a copy of it, but yeah. I think I think it's I think for the comprehension I think you'll comprehend it more if you have a book. Yeah. How do you spell that Boverty? B O V E R T Y or B O V B O V A R Y. Yeah, we'll read that in November. I'll go ahead and um, order. Could you uh, stay after class for a few minutes so I can ask you a few questions about the paper? Sure. Okay. I'll just have like 38 questions. It's not that much. Yeah, next week we'll do Shakespeare. So Hamlet next week. It's in our book. It's the, I think Hamlet's pretty close to the end of volume one of our book here. Yeah, I think it's one of the last. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much right at the end of our book, Hamlet. So um, for Shakespeare next week, I would encourage like Shakespeare has a bad rap in schools. We'll talk we'll talk about that next week. Shakespeare has a bad rap because high schools teach Shakespeare wrong. High schools teach Shakespeare to be stuffy and boring, right? I think if I have a gift in this class. I think it's showing that this that stuff you might show is stuffy and boring. I think I'm good at showing that it's not stuffy and boring, right? I think I think that's my talent, right? So Shakespeare is not stuffy and boring. His stuff is very very rich. It's full of sex and violence and all this stuff, right? So um, yeah, having somebody to explain this stuff help explain this stuff is is makes a big deal when you read something and it's hard to understand anyway and then you're just like kind of left like hmm is that what that meant or what wonder what that so that it's yeah you're good at it thanks thank you yeah and you know like in high school their teachers are really handcuffed too it is because every every week class goes by i always remember how you said that You've got bad reviews because people have said that your class isn't very organized, and that is just shit. That's crazy. Because <laughs> it's a, uh, it's extremely, or in my opinion, anyway, it's extremely organized. Sometimes when people say that, I don't know how I can make it any more organized. No. I like you, they, you they just don't me. know how to use blackboard and instead of accepting responsibility yeah. they point the finger it's work they don't uh, people mm. kids don't want to work mm -mm. Can, can you can you guys all navigate the blackboard page does it make sense mm. okay something i mean it, it's pretty simple but sometimes it can be which I've got four classes online, so it's a lot. But I keep a copy of the syllabus, just yep. tucked in the front of my book. That way, I always know what we're doing. Right. 
that's a lesson that's lost on a lot of college students. Mm -hmm. I need to yeah. Do that. Yeah, that's exactly people that. really that's like she said this you know younger younger generation is really lazy too no offense big fan but mm -hmm. be real i mean my generation was lazy too 90 percent of people my age are potheads so <laughs> but but they have an excuse <laughs> yeah so just to give you guys a preview of what Hamlet's about. If you've seen The Lion King, you know what Hamlet is, right? It, it's pretty much a story of a prince. And he's sad because his father dies, as you'll find out. And weirdly enough, his father's brother married his, uh, his mother like a month after. So... Uh, well, it's a Halloween story in a way, right? The, the ghost comes and tells Hamlet stuff up and shenanigans ensue from there, all right? So there's, there's your preview for, for next week. Go, go into Shakespeare knowing that he's not that bad, right? If you've understood all, all this other stuff, you'll get Shakespeare. So, and so go into it knowing that. I encourage you guys next week, too, before you come to class, if you do have a hard time with it, just watch a film adaptation of Hamlet. There's like a million of them. Um, can't hurt. Can't hurt just to kind of see how it's performed on stage as well as how it's read off the paper. So it can't hurt if you watch a film adaptation of it. Um, let me, see, let me see real quick. I'll tell you ones that are readily available. In middle school, they really wanted us to get it, so they took us to watch the play. Did they? <laughs> yeah. For Hamlet? Yeah. That's one story that I've probably been taught about four times throughout middle school and high school. Each different ways. Yeah, whenever we have lists of like Western lit and like the canon and what's the most important book ever, like a lot of people put Hamlet number one. So we'll see if it lives up to that standard for you all next week. Um, it's, a, it's not even my favorite of Shakespeare's plays. I think it's a little overrated, but nonetheless, it's still good. It's good stuff. So Shakespeare's language is modern English, despite what people will say, it's modern. Because I showed you what Middle English looks like today. It's not Middle English, it's modern English. Mm -hmm. So, well, uh, yeah, go, in, go into it knowing that too, right? He, he's got, he invented thousands of words. Right? That's, some, that's something else to think about as you read it. But um, it's, it's a fairly long read if you read it all. So definitely pace yourself well next week. Maybe read a little bit of it at a time. You will, um, well, yeah, maybe read an act at a time and then take a break. That's my best advice. There's five acts. Maybe you like read a little bit at a time. You'll get into the story more that way. But that's all. Like we're just doing the Hamlet, no other stories, and for for the discussion posts, I'm asking you to do the first two acts of Hamlet on Monday, and then on the main reading, it will, it will finish it. So everybody will do a response about the first couple of acts early next week. Okay. And since you guys come to Zoom, you don't have to worry about the later in the week one. So you guys do, will do we get class credit for doing these Zooms? Yeah. I think I seen you had post a grade or something about one last week. 
Yeah, you know, all of you uh, who come to Zooms, I just haven't put them in yet, but all of you who come mm. to Zooms, and if you've participated, you'll get a 10 out of 10 on that weekly assignment. Mm. So, I just haven't plugged them in yet. She has who come to Zoom, you get 10 out of 10 on that. So you have no worries. Yeah, just show up on Thursday and uh, and I'll just talk enough for all of us and everybody can get their participation points. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I scanned through everybody, all these pictures, uh, like all the videos as I'm talking. I'm like, now, which one of y'all have the best face? Of, would you please just shut the hell up? Like, as I'm going, looking at everybody's face. <laughs> you, you walk, it's usually, you walk it's around usually, and I'm like, well, uh, I'm you're bouncing dry. back and you're forth checking on, my, checking on my kids. And... Yeah, I know. You're hyper. Yeah, there's, there's a couple of weeks early in the semester. I should have taken better records than I did because people were dropping in and out Thursday and Friday. It was hard to keep up with. But over the past couple of weeks, I've been keeping better records. So let's say that I give you a grade saying you weren't on Zoom when you were. Just correct me if that's the case, because my records a couple weeks early in the semester were kind of, I should have took better records. So um, I kind of know everybody's faith. Everybody here, I already know at this point, right? So I kind of, early in the semester, I was kind of mostly going on memory. So in case I do, Mark, if you're not being there a day you were, just tell me, I'll fix it. I think, did I, didn't I do that to you, Emily? Didn't I say you weren't here a day? Yeah. And she was. So, this just, just correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. But the past three, four weeks, you know, I've kept good records. So, no worries. Now that I've got your papers, now I should, now some good, now some grades should be coming in uh, more than discussions. I mean, you guys will start to get the real grades back now. So, any other questions, class business, or whatever, before we conclude today? That essay is due tomorrow at midnight, right? Right. Okay. Yeah, so tomorrow by midnight. So long, I'll just say this, so long as Saturday afternoon when I wake up, because I always wake up in the afternoon because I'm lazy. And so long as it's there by Saturday afternoon, I'm content. Okay. So there, there you go. I told a class earlier, I might not be a wealthy man being a professor, but I get to sleep till noon like every day, right? So that, that's a form of wealth and it's in and of itself. Anything else? All right, guys. Good class. I enjoyed it. We'll see you guys again next week. Bye. I'm not. <laughs>